Please welcome to the TEDxSF stage, Schumann Goes Majumder. I'd like to talk to you today about a public health issue which is very different in other parts of the world than it is here in the United States. I'd like to share two stories about HIV education challenges which may be very difficult for us to even conceive of here. Now, because it's depressing to just talk about problems without also talking about solutions, I'd also like to tell you about the work of an organization that I founded with my wife and a team from Stanford that helps address these issues. The first story is from India. This is Andhra Pradesh, one of India's 28 states. To give you a sense of the scale of India, Andhra Pradesh has a population of 84 million, which is larger than the population of California, Texas, and New York combined, all in a land area the size of Nevada. Now, India has the world's third largest HIV population, and it has a national AIDS control organization, which has created health education materials to be able to educate the entire country. Here's what happened when those health education materials were provided in one particular part of the country. These are actually teachers who are burning the materials that were provided to them. And what's important to note here is that they're not only expressing their own opinions, but also the opinions of parents in the community who didn't want to have their children exposed to these topics. It's extremely important to understand that the key issue here is HIV stigma. There is extreme stigma associated with HIV in India, and it's what we call dual stigma. Not only is the virus itself the subject of stigma, but it's also associated with activities which have traditionally been taboo to even talk about. There was a particularly heartbreaking incident in Andhra Pradesh where HIV-positive children were actually expelled from their schools as a result of parents of other children stating that they didn't want to have their children in the same classroom as them. So the challenge here is how to provide HIV education in a place where the, even the idea of providing it may be considered to be objectionable. In fact, it's so objectionable that sex education itself was banned in 10 states across India. And a number of prominent politicians said that children should not be provided with sex education, instead they should be taught yoga. Botswana has a completely different set of challenges than India. Botswana has one of the world's highest HIV prevalence rates. Nearly one in four adults in the entire country is HIV positive. The country has made tremendous strides in being able to address the problem over several decades, but that now what they are experiencing is what's called HIV fatigue. The population has received so many mass media campaigns and so many fragmented messages about HIV that they feel like they understand everything that there is to know about HIV even when they're missing fundamental knowledge. So the challenge here was how do you provide HIV education to a population that just isn't interested in hearing any more about it? India and Botswana are on opposite ends of what we call the HIV knowledge gap continuum. It's important to note that the HIV knowledge gap exists even in places, sometimes especially in places where there have been millions of dollars invested in mass media campaigns. So why haven't these campaigns worked? In order to answer this, I want to take you back a few years. In 2005, my wife was doing research at Stanford with a team looking to examine how HIV education was provided in different countries around the world. What they discovered was that even in places hardest hit by the virus, that there were still fundamental gaps in the population's knowledge. Because of the level of investment, which had obviously gone into these awareness campaigns, the will was clearly there, but there was something which is fundamentally broken about the model through which education was being delivered. So they set out to come up with an alternate approach. Over the next four years, and through numerous research studies and over 500 iterations, they came up with a brand new model for HIV education. They invented modular, highly customizable, interactive software which demonstrated the greatest efficacy rate of any approach to HIV education which had been tested. It demonstrated the highest learning effects, 
the highest retention effects, as well as, and most importantly, the highest acceptance rates and comfort rates. What we did after that in 2009 was spin the project out of Stanford and into an independent nonprofit called Teach Aids. Today, our materials are distributed around the world under a Creative Commons license by more than 200 organizations in 73 countries. Here's an example of some of those materials. It is a serious virus that causes the condition AIDS. De cualquier edad, sexo, raza o religión. And HIV cannot survive in the air. There are many things that we have learned along the way. First and foremost, there's a huge difference between awareness and education. The awareness levels in India and Botswana were actually very high, either because of the high stigma levels or because of the mass media campaigns. But the basic knowledge about HIV was still missing. So what was required was real education, as opposed to merely awareness. So you think about other subjects, like math. You don't have math awareness campaigns. You don't have billboards which say 1 plus 1 equals 2, and other billboards that say 4 times 5 equals 20, and hope that eventually the message will sink in. You teach math systematically in schools. And the same thing needs to be done with HIV education in order to be effective. But instead of requiring an investment of hundreds or even thousands of hours in the classroom, the research team was able to come up with an approach which only took 25 minutes. Now, we did need to have those 25 minutes, though. Another thing that we learned was the importance of comfort. Fear-based campaigns actually inhibited learning, and they could also increase stigma. And in addition to that, whenever you would have imagery which would be deemed to be too explicit, you risked having the campaign being banned outright. So there are many different design decisions which went into creating software which was going to be as comfortable as possible. One of those decisions was the use of 2D cartoon imagery. And that looks like something which might have been chosen because it looks fun, but in fact, it was chosen because of the fact that it was the perfect balance between clarity and comfort. Other things that we learned along the way included the importance of trust and the importance of gender concordance. In terms of gender concordance, it's extremely important to be able to recognize that girls preferred getting instruction from females and boys preferred getting instruction from males. So each version of the TeachAid software is actually customized according to both genders. In terms of trust, it was important that the message came not only accurately but also from individuals and avatars that were inherently trusted. So in India, we went to Bollywood, and we enlisted the help of numerous Bollywood celebrities. In Botswana, the most popular celebrities were recording artists. We chose these artists and celebrities not only in the, on the basis of their popularity, but also on the basis of their, their reputation for giving back to the country and supporting their people. So how were these interventions actually received? We were blown away by the response. In India, they were distributed across states where sex education had been banned. In Andhra Pradesh, they actually distributed 25,000 installations of the software across schools, hospitals, and counseling facilities. This was a state which had the highest stigma levels in the entire country and was now getting the most effective HIV education available anywhere, and they loved it. It demonstrated 98% comfort levels and acceptance levels, which one of our advisors at Stanford told us was in Disney territory, and completely unheard of for something which dealt with something so controversial as HIV. In Botswana, they actually went a step further and declared June 15th to be National Teach AIDS Day. And they had learning which took place all over the country. So what I'd like to leave you with is this. These are just two stories that represent a sample from hundreds that we've received from all over the world about unique challenges that every country faces in HIV education and how they're using our materials to be able to solve them. Education is only one piece of the puzzle in addressing HIV, but it is a fundamental component of prevention. And unfortunately, it's still broken in many countries around the world. The good news is, 
that we're confident that in the next five years, we're going to be able to work with many organizations around the world to be able to fix it. Thank you.